This will be our last installment of Sunday Fun Day, and we'll be back to normal preaching. And so uh, for those of you that have been just visiting for the next uh, last four weeks, uh, then I will not be as funny as I am right now. So um, uh, if the expectation was up here, just bring it down. And so uh, today we're going to be talking about patience, okay? And I know that all of us struggle with patience. And in the story that you just heard a moment ago, um, really it was just a matter of perspective, right? Perspective and patience are wed together. And a lot of times if we could just change our perspective on the same set of circumstances, our outlook would be completely transformed. And I, I'll think about examples of that all the time. And I see people that in, our today, in today's culture, we say they're positive people, right? Positive people can always find the good in a perspective. Whereas when we are negative, we will always find the bad. An example would be, does everybody remember the movie Christmas Vacation? Does everybody remember the movie Christmas Vacation, right? Like Clark has spent all of his time, like hundreds of thousands of light bulbs have been particularly placed and finally, it comes on, the Shekinah glory shines around it. The nuclear generator has to be flipped on just for Clark's house to be able to be magnificently lit up. They all go out, and the family is sitting there on the front lawn, and everybody is beholding the majesty that is this light show, which is roughly the way that my wife views Christmas as well, and yet there is a father-in-law who is negative. Does anybody remember what he said? What did he say? The little lights aren't twinkling, Clark. Thanks for noticing. He says, thanks for noticing, Art. <laughs> like, how could you see this, right, and yet only fixate on the negative? Man, some of you are with laser precision able to perceive the negative in every situation. Understand this, you are not a fun person, okay? And you need to change that about yourself. So you could just do this little test inside your mind. You could say, is what I'm getting ready to say positive or is it negative? Is it a criticism or is it constructive? Can I take the same phrasing and package it differently? Would that, would that change? Do you think that would change your marriage? Anybody in here, like by show of hand, do you think it would change your marriage? Like if you thought to yourself, am I getting ready to say something positive? No, that's not positive. Should I say it then? No, I probably should. It would change your perspective if you pushed yourself to find a positive thing to say. Our theme verse, let's look at that together. Fourth week in a row. It says, happy heart is a good medicine. A happy heart is a good medicine. But a broken spirit drains your strength. We are trying to get you to a happy heart, right? Trying to get you to a happy heart. Because as Christians, we should have the ultimate positive outlook on life, right? Why? Because when you consider the end game, right? The end game, the worst that can happen on this earth, the worst that can happen on this earth is death or death of a loved one. That's it. That's like, there's no greater worst than death. And as believers, we should know with expectation what happens after death. Eternity with Jesus, right? Right? Like you should come in here every week and it would shift your perspective radically. If you were like, man, I know I'm one step closer to being with Jesus. One of these days, I'm gonna leave this terrible, crappy earth and I am going to be in eternity with Jesus, not around any negative now. I wonder if some people though, that go to church would get to heaven like, well, it's not as bright as I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> like, come on, come on, shift. Shift your perspective. Live like you are going to spend eternity with Jesus. And I guarantee you, the days that you're feeling down, if you could celebrate the fact that you are connected to the eternal creator of the universe who has carved out a divine purpose for your life, there is no way in the world that you could be like, ah, oh, 
traffic again. My day is ruined. Like, there's no way. There's no way. We are so impatient, so impatient. Are any of you guys, or if you are married to this person, are any of you guys nudgers at the, at the traffic light, like you nudge up? Has anybody seen that person? Like, you're so impatient that like, you, once you come to a stop, even though the light is turned red, like you, I gotta, you gotta like keep on, like, what is that all about? You're not, it's not helping. You're not getting anywhere any faster by the little, little, I'm always like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Just calm down. It's gonna turn. Impatience, impatience. And inevitably in a relationship, you're gonna have different levels of pacing as a result or in respect to your level of patience, right? Right? That's going to happen. It's going to happen. Matter of fact, look at our theme verse for this week on patience. In the love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, it says, love is patient and kind. Love is patient and kind. We're going to say the word patient on the count of three. One, two, three. Patient. Patient. Are you patient? Every relationship is going to have, generally speaking, one fast-moving person, and then one maybe relatively slow-moving person, all right? And I, in our relationship, I am that person. I am a plotter, right? I'm like uh, Michael Myers in the Halloween movies. You know, like he's always walking, but yet he's ultimately getting there, right? Just like slow. But I'm, I'm, I'm methodical. I'm a plotter. Carrie is a sprinter, Carry, like there is nothing in our house that is not like a whirling blur of a person, right? And if we go somewhere, imagine if our pacing did not ultimately get to where it was harmonized, she would always be like, I mean, literally, she's got these little short legs, but they move so fast, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 okay. And so like, in order for us to walk together at some juncture, what do we have to do? We have to adjust our pace. Maybe I need to pick it up a little bit. Maybe she needs to calm it down a little bit so that we can walk together. But imagine if you're impatient in the relationship, your pace is going to be different. And then all of a sudden, you're going to be separated from one another as a result of your lack of adequate pacing. And I, I started thinking about that patience factor. And patience really has to do with people, right? People will make us patience. Patience will make us work better with people. It's a virtue. It's the first thing on the list in the love chapter. The first thing that God wanted you to see whenever we talk about it at weddings, it always, always, love is patient, love is kind, love does not puff up itself, it does bear any record. First out of the gate, love is patient. How often are you patient with the people that you love the most. I guarantee you, people will make you patient. If you are an impatient person, you will spend a lot of your life going, come on, 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 hey, come on, come on. Is that done yet? Do you have that done yet? Are you done? Do I need to check back in with you? Fire email, 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 email. Like, that's what impatient people do. And so, I started thinking about that and I sent it out to our staff and I thought it'd be creative, you know, fun. Like, hey, do you guys have any stories when it comes to like being impatient? And what was interesting is that in regards to the concept of patience, they started replying back and this is like a video chat we have with our staff called Marco Polo, whatever. And, um, and so all of them started replying back and the stories all had to do with their significant other or their children so it had to do with them having to be patient with other people. It wasn't like God is teaching me patience and I'm growing in this area because I've learned to have to wait on the Lord. No, it was like, well, my husband, my wife does this and I have learned I've got to be real patient for that person. You see what I'm saying? Like, we, it's interesting that they thought of other people when they thought about their patience. Anyway, just the just a, just a thought that I just want to throw out there. It was just interesting. And I thought there's two really types of patience that I want to talk about in the start of the message. And that's patience for people and patience with people. All right. 
And patience for people means that in order for them to succeed, you have to be patient. That sometimes it's for their good that you have to control yourself or do something that might not be something you're comfortable doing because you want to set someone else up for success. Sometimes there's some patience involved. Um, God always likes to give me new material. And so last Monday, after Sunday of preaching, uh, Titus and I were able to go out fishing. And um, we, were, we were out all day long uh, fishing at Lake Fork. And so it's two hours over there, you know, we're there at dawn. And then we come back after the sun goes down and it's late, okay, it's late. And, um, you know, we're tired and, and uh, all the things. And I get back, and uh, actually, am I telling that wrong? Is it me and Ben? Yeah, it's me and Ben. And <laughs> I get home, and um, when I got home, uh, Titus comes downstairs, and he says, hey, the power's out in my room, right? This is like 9.30, 10 p.m. at night at this juncture. And, um, and I was like, okay, father-son moment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach him how to work a breaker box, right? Everybody knows, needs to know how to work a breaker box whenever something goes off. So we go out, and I open my garage door, and there is a rat in my garage. And I'm not talking like a little baby field mouse. I'm talking about a full-grown baby rabbit rat, okay? <laughs> I'm talking like this rat was so fat that he could not run normal, all right? He had to like kind of, so I open the door and this rat is eating. We have those little sticky traps like by the front of our garage. He's eating the little lizards that have gotten caught in the mouse trap. He's like, and, and like, he like, he like saw me come out of my garage door, my, my house. And he like, and he scampered over here behind um, a bookcase. And I was like, did you see that? He was like, yes, I saw that. And uh, this is Titus's first rat interaction, right? And this is like, how do you become a man type of moment, right? And I'm like, oh boy, this isn't good. This is not good. This is not good. This is not good. We, we have got to solve this problem. And so he humored me for a little bit, but once I got his power turned back on, he was like, all right, dad, I don't have time for this. I just started calling, blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, um, this was a video I took when I was trying to figure out how I was going to solve that problem. All I have to do is wait five minutes, maybe 10. He's eating the bugs that are stuck to the trap. So, can I kill a mouse or a rat by myself? I don't think I can. I don't think I can. I need Titus to help me. Did he help me? No. He's like, oh, I'm gonna go back upstairs. Power keeps going out in his room, wonder why. Probably got 700 devices on in there. <laughs> Carrie's gonna freak out. If Titus was married, he would understand that I have to solve this problem. This problem needs to be solved. <laughs> so I am now faced with this dilemma. My wife gets up at 5 a.m. to go work out, right? Dumbest thing ever, right? Nobody gets up, like, unless there's a gun to your head, 5 a.m. is not meant, that's not, the sun hasn't even come up yet. Why would you get up, right? And uh, now if you're going fishing, completely different story. But <laughs> just to go work out, no. And so um, I know that this is going to happen. This is going to go down, all right? And I had went out back and forth a couple of times, and every time the lights would go off in my garage, you know, it's a little timer, the rat would come back out. And so I was like, I, I, I must solve this. If she comes out and there is a rat, and I'm not, I'm not underscore like a, a baby chihuahua size rat is what I want. <laughs> like get it in your head. This is not an exaggeration. And so I, I, I take a broom and I go out and I start div divining my plan, right? As the great, like Steve, uh, what's his face? That Irwin, Irwin? Um, or Crocodile Dundee, I prefer. And so, so I open the garage door side that he ran behind the bookcase, and I go out. This is now like 11, 11.30 at night, right? And I have a broom in my hand, and I'm holding it like a samurai warrior, right? And I'm, I'm waiting till the lights go out, and I'm just sitting, I like, be one. 
be one with the nature. And I, in my mind, I'm just going to wait, right? And I wait. And if I wait long enough, he's going to run out. And then I'm whammo, I'm going to take care of business, right? And, um, and so I'm sitting there and I'm like trying to like be like a sniper. Like, you know, I'm calculating the wind and which way the wind direction is so he doesn't smell my scent. And I am trying to be like deadly still, right? And I'm, si- and I'm just imagining all this time, like what it looks like if a neighbor drives by right now, right? They see this man standing outside his garage with just like a broom in his hand, right? What is wrong with that guy, you know? He's had one too many. No. And so um, I'm sitting there and... Uh, the rat, for 15 minutes, I sit there like a like laser still, right? And he, do, he doesn't come out. And I go grab Titus, and I'm like, Titus, you, you don't understand. We have to solve this problem. Your mom will freak out. And so we go back down, and I, I manage to start, like, hitting the boxes that are underneath this, this book or this uh, table. We got all these junk boxes. Anybody else have junk in your garage? There's a lot of rat hiding places in my garage. So like I managed to shoot, like get, get this rat. He's like running back and forth under there. And I'm like just hitting these boxes, right? And I, and I, I don't even know. Like I'm just still imagining like a, a, someone driving by. Like this man is just sitting there, you know, and Titus is standing there in his underwear. Anyway, it's like a whole scene that's going, going down in my garage. Garage doors are open anyway. And we get him cornered up into the front of the garage. And I was like, I see him, I see him, I see him. And there he is. He's like a little beady eye guy, right? And I, I can't see him from my perspective. And Titus is way back from me. He is not ready to become a man at this juncture and help kill the rat. He just wants to watch dad try to kill the rat. And so I moved this marker board because we got lots of crazy stuff at our house. Marker board in your garage. I don't know. And all of a sudden, Ty's like, hey, it ran out. I was like, what? He goes, it ran between your legs, right? <laughs> like, so I was like so close to this thing. And, he like, and I didn't even see it, didn't even know it. Like, I was thinking, like, what if that would have ran up my leg? Oh, my. We'd have a different sermon here. <laughs> we'd have a sermon about guarding your mouth is what we would have. Like, <laughs> Every word that proceeds out of the mouth is from the Lord. That would have been from the devil. And so he ran up into Carrie's car, like, like into the wheel well and like disappeared. And I'm like, oh, this isn't good. Now I'm imagining her coming out to start her car and I'm rat running out into her, like trying to jump up on her and like attack her with its fangs of death, right? And I was like, well, I don't even know what to do. And so I call my buddy, there you go. Sorry. Just got to be, yeah, you got to be ready. And so, so I, I videoed, that's who I was talking to. I was talking to Ben and Hollis and I was like, what, what do you guys think? And Hollis like, you need to move your car. That's what you need to do. You got to take the car out because if he's in the car, when you start the car, hopefully he'll just run away. And so I moved the car like now it's like 12 o'clock at night. I move it out. And so far we have solved the rat problem, all right? I, a rat Rat killer extraordinaire. I feel like somehow I killed it, but even if it just got away, at least it's not in my garage, right? And I thought, I did all that for love, for love, right? Because my wife cannot see a rat. It's not going to happen in the born household. We'll be having to move and all kinds of things. And so I thought sometimes you got to be patient for people. Like, like you, had to, you have to do things. You have to stand. You have to take. You have to absorb. You have to take it for the team. Because you want to be patient for others. I thought, man, wouldn't that be great if we translated that perspective that sometimes it's not what we want to do. I don't want to be the rat killer, but I know that I must be. I must be the rat. Guys, if you're single in here and one day you hope to get married, you have to become a rat killer, okay? And, and I know that this is a little off topic, but I just want to say in the vein of the pet thing, um, you know, I've noticed a new thing that's happening. And this is just extra. This isn't in the sermon. This is just something I need to get off my chest. Okay? Like, I've noticed, I was at Bass Pro Shops a couple years ago, and now people, they bring their pets to the, to the store. Has anybody seen this? Like, and, I, and I'm not judging you if you are one of those people, but, like, they, you now, like, bring your dogs and like I was in this Bass Pro, and I swear it was like I was at a dog park. There wasn't like one or two, it was like five dogs. People were just walking their dogs. And you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a pet person. I don't like animals jumping up on me, licking me, nosing me in certain areas. And, 
And there was these, these dogs, and they kept, like, kind of sniffing around at me. And in my mind, I was like a pit bull that's going to attack me, right? And, and then, like, two dogs got into it. It's like, rawr, rawr, rawr. And I was thinking to myself, when did, when did we decide as a society that you could just bring your pet to the store? I was like, I'm not down with that. I'm not down with that. And I want to show you really why I'm not down with it. Because, like, it's a little bit, it's a little bit discriminatory, right? Because can you, what if I had a pet boa, right? What if I had a pet boa? Can I, can I bring my pet boa? Can I bring my pet boa to the Bass Pro Shop and let it like slither on people? What do you think would happen? I bet they would freak out, right? You're being a snakeist. That's a racist snake person. Like if you are against snakes, then why can we have dogs and we can't have snakes? I'm just saying like if there is a universal rule, it should apply to all pets. Like I'll bring my baby bear in there and let it maul someone. Yeah, 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 that's the same thing. It's the same thing. Bring your pets to your house and leave them, all right? That's how I feel about it, all right? And now I've got that off my chest. We have patience for people. And then we have patience with people, okay? Patience with people. And I was trying to think, like, how could I illustrate patience with people, right? Because a lot of times we're, we just grow impatient with people. You're like, faster, faster, move. And um, I know some of you probably are married to someone where you feel like that. And so I thought I would try to help you. Maybe you're like that at the office. And like, how can you learn to be more patient? And I dug down to the annals of time in the Bourne household. And I thought I would share this one. And I think this one illustrates the story succinctly. But um, potty training, right? Potty training. Do you guys think, for all those that have, that have potty trained in here, did you think it required patience? Anybody? Patience? Have you ever thought about that, like from an outsider's perspective about potty training, that like you're trying to coach this human to do something in public, like because you're watching them, that should only be done in private, right? Am I, am I the only one, like, and you're like, come on, in our house we had a word, it was called shooey, and Carrie would be like in the other room, like, come on, you can shooey, come on, you can do it, and we get, we get this little chair, and we put them on the chair, and then like we read them books, and it was like the what, caterpillar, what? The hungry caterpillar, she's like reading them a story, and like, and then like if they accomplish the task, you're like celebrate it like it's a birthday. You're like, ah, look, they were able to go shoey in the bathroom. Well, you know, I mean, that is so wild. And I think if you can potty train someone, you should be able to stay married to anyone, right? I mean, it's really like if you can make it through that, you should be able to run the marathon. And and so as one of our children had slightly aged out of the potty training, it doesn't mean that there's not temporary setbacks that occur. And I don't know if you've ever been sized up uh, by a toddler, but, but I have, I have. I, I see, they saw the fear in my eyes. And, and so Carrie was, was kind of diaper duty person and I was stay up and get the baby to sleep person, all right? We had roles and responsibilities, they're very clear lines, okay? Because I have a natural gag reflex that has been displayed here, um, whenever I get around smells, I just start making this noise and nothing comes out ever, but I will just keep making that noise over and over again. And Carrie was going out shopping. It was circa early December uh, for Christmas shopping. And she went out with one of her girlfriends to go shopping. And it was like the door closed. And now I was like, I was on patrol, right? And it was as if when the door closed, the sixth sense of my child kicked in. And he's looking at me like, tonight's going to be your night. <laughs> Tonight. I, I, it, was not, it was not hours into the shop. It was minutes. Minutes into the shopping, I hear what can only be described as a commotion in the bathroom. And a small child doesn't realize that, that sound travels, right? Everybody, like, that's, you have that advantage until they're, like, teenagers, right? Um, and so... So like there's this commotion in the bathroom and I'm probably watching a game or something and I'm like, and I'm like you know, you just, you just have that sense like you need to go check. Like you ever have that sense? Like it's like, mm, I should go check on that, right? And so I open the bathroom door and I, I was not prepared. I was not prepared. So an accident has occurred and my son has decided to try to cover up slash clean up the evidence and has their pants off and has grabbed the towels out of the cabinet and is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. And, and I am like, like two steps back, right? Like 
I, I, I am like, call Carrie 911. Like, I'm like, ah! you know, and I, yeah. And I, that's, that's the only noise I can make in this, in this time frame. And, and I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I am, I, I feel like I'm a fairly smart, brilliant person. And I'm like, nothing. I got nothing right now. Like, what do I, because like, you just think like, I got to move all of this somehow to somewhere. And there's like little rugs down and it's in that. I mean, stuff is going to be thrown away. That is the only, like, I don't know if you, some of you are like, I'm going to clean it. I'm like, no, I'm going to throw this all away. I'm going to burn it uh, tonight. And so this child has it from like stem to stern all the way. It's like, took a bath in it. And so like, I grab his hand and I lift him and I take him to the back door, open the back door. It's December, right? And I carry him. And on the back patio, we had a water hose that was right over here. And I was like, this is the only way this problem can be solved, right? And so I take the water hose and I just start squirting him down. He's like, daddy, it's cold. Daddy, it's cold. I was like, I know, I know, I know, I know, but we didn't have to be here, did we? We didn't. I, I didn't make this choice. You you made this choice for me, and now I have to carry this out. And did we ever have a problem again? No, we did not. So if you get past potty training and there's an accident and it's cold outside, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Patience with people. Man, when you think about it, you know, I know that that's a silly illustration of potty training a child, but I think a lot of times from God's perspective, that's kind of what he views us, Right? We are, we are sitting here constantly making messes. And he's like, aren't we past this? And God has this infinite amount of patience with us. And I just wonder, like, how is it that he could be so patient with us? And then we have him living inside of us that's supposed to be guiding us. And yet we, we have no patience with other people. It's somewhere along the way, that needs to translate, right? That if he can have that much patience with you, it should grow your patience with others. And so I was thinking more down that line of patience, and I thought, what is the opposite of patience? Patience opposite is impulsive, right? And there's a great verse about wisdom and counseling, and we'll put it up on the screen. Look at this. It says, where there is no counsel, okay? So you need to have counsel in your life. You need to have people with spiritual wisdom from the Bible, mind you. Um, He says, the people fall. So you are prone to make mistakes whenever you don't have counsel. He says, but the multitude of counselors, so if you have a lot of spiritual voices speaking truth into your life, there is safety. In the multitude of wisdom, there is safety. The inverse I have found is equally and oppositely true. In the multitude of idiots, there will be danger, okay? So in the multitude of counselors, there will be safety. In the multitude of idiots, there will be danger. Now, I'm going to say something um, now, and I, and I know that this this, this might sound somewhat sexist, but I think I'm going in the right direction. Um, whenever a group of women get together, you know, I don't think that it's the same as when a group of men get together. Because if you have, I'm going to put the ratio above three. Above three men that get together for any length of time, something stupid is going to happen. I, mark my words. If you just give a group of men enough time crazy is going to happen. And I don't know why God made us this way. It's probably the brain damage I talked about last week. But, but every group of, every minute, like you, last time you were around, like 10 guys for more than two hours, market, something, something happened, right? Am I right? Am I saying wrong? No, I'm, that's why when guys get older, they just start staying at home. They've, they've, they've eclipsed their amount of idiocy. And now they're like, I, you know what? I can't do that anymore. I just got to stay home. I'm getting old. I might break. And so that's why they stay home more. And so when I was a young man, I wanted to share a couple of stories, and I want to preface these with I was not, was not drinking. Um, it would make more sense had I been drinking. But I was in college, and um, we would go play sports and then go hang out, and we would go to happy hour. And not the happy hour you're thinking, because um, I would go to Sonic, and Sonic would have half price off drinks, right? And, like, we would go to happy hour, and I always get a strawberry slush. So it's a, it's a cherry slush with real strawberries. I'm very particular about this. So it's a pump of cherry juice with no actual cherry. And then you put the strawberries in there, swirl it up. Mm, 
perfect little beverage. And so it was spring, the birds were singing. And so we decided to go down to this like park bench area that bordered this river. And as we were driving down there, it was me and one of my buddies named Jason Kay. And he is a crazy friend that you're gonna get in trouble with. And then my, my, my college roommate, who was also a preacher, so I was a preacher, he was a preacher. And he was my roommate and he was the straight arrow. His name was Mike, okay? He was straight arrow, like walked with Jesus, never sinned a day in his life, right? He's like, he's like the Apostle John, right? Whereas I'm like the Apostle Peter. Like I find I am not a straight arrow. I'm a crooked arrow, right? I will, I will eventually hit the target, but I, I, I will dabble on the edges, right? And so uh, we were driving down to this park area and we have our slushies in tow and we played a couple hours. I think that day of, it could be any sport, but that day it was racquetball. And so we were enjoying a, a, a slushy afterwards. And we were driving down there when as we crossed over uh, this bridge, it was parallel to a train track bridge. And uh, the movie Stand By Me back in the day, anybody remember that? Like they ran across that bridge and there was that bridge in the distance with the train track. And I told my buddy, Jason Kay, and I was like, hey, wouldn't it be awesome? You know, one of these days we'll like go over there and go down there where the road meets that train track and like get up there and cross over that bridge just to do it, right? For no reason. No, there's no like reward for doing it, but it was like, yeah, that'd be fun. And I was like, but I said, Michael, Michael never do that, right? So we, we get down there and we're, we're having our slushies and, and uh, this train starts coming and from, from like the left side of the train track, it would, you could see for miles in this train, like, whoa, whoa, and it's like, started coming down through there. And, I, and I, I mentioned it while we're sitting at the tables. I was like, hey, w- me and Jason, we're talking about on the way over here. Uh, I was telling Mike, I was like, we were like, ah, you know, one of these days, you know, we'll get up there. And I was thinking, you know, Mike will never go for it. And Mike, this is like the day in his life, the one day that he had a wild hair. And Mike said, let's do it. And I was like, these windows of opportunity to corrupt someone only come so often, folks. <laughs> Only comes so often, right? And I am like a moth to a flame. Like, oh, he's, he'll do it. Let's do it. All right, we're doing it. And so the train has already passed. That's how you know you're safe, okay? So we get up on these tracks and we start walking. It's probably about three-quarter of a mile, 20 foot, 22 foot-ish up in the air. And we, we get all the way to where the bridge spans the river. And in between those slots, or there's nothing, like your foot can go through these slots because they're spaced out about eight to 10 inches apart. And so like now we're like all like going and all of a sudden in the distance, coming from the opposite direction, apparently there was a place for the trains are coming the opposite way to get on the same track. And there was like a honk, honk. And around the corner, probably no less than maybe a mile-ish going, you know, whatever speed it's going, is a train. And Me, Mike, and Jason Kay are all sitting there, and I've decided that we're going to have a discussion as to how we're going to handle this problem. There are these giant pillars that this bridge is sitting on that were about eight to 10 foot down. I was like, if we jump off of this train track down to that, and then we could jump off from that onto the ground. And so I I start talking to Jason, and I look, Mike is gone. Mike was a all-state running back in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and he he is booking it like, like, he, he left us, right? <laughs> left us. And so I told Jason Kay, I was like, you think we should jump? You think? He goes, no, I want to run. My crazy friend is now like, let's run. And I thought the simplest thing just to get out of harm's way, okay, we're running. Okay, so we start running, and it was like a movie. He starts running out of gas with about 100 yards to go. And the train guy is back there, wong, wong, just barreling down on it. I'm like, as if we can go faster, right? It's not helping us, right? Your, your horn is not making us go any faster. And Jason's like, just leave me, just leave me. So dramatic, so dramatic. I was like, no, it was like saving Private Ryan moment. You can do it, come on, man. And we get to the end and I'm talking only like a probably three to five second differential. We fall off the tracks. Oh, 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 why we, oh, well, that was close, that was close. And then uh, we did this in the middle of the day, by the way. Stupid, right? And now the police come. Yeah. So people saw us. We were waving at people driving under the bridge that we were on. And and they called the cops on us. Party foul. And apparently because it crosses state lines, felony, whatever stuff. 
And my buddy, who's the straight arrow, who's never done anything bad in his life, he's over there thinking, I've ruined my ministry. <laughs> I, on the other hand, I'm thinking, what a great message. <laughs> I am going to be able to preach out of this. And so just the difference, just the difference of perspective. And you think to yourself, you know, like as you age, you probably age out of that. No, it's, that's not true. That's simply just not true. A couple of years ago, right outside of this building, right outside of this building, we were planning for our uprising men's retreat. And a couple of different iterations of our uprising, we've created a potato gun. Now, is it illegal to make a potato gun? I don't know exactly what the law is, but some, I think, say you can't make those. But I don't know. We probably made one that was legal. But let's just say that we made one, okay? And we were going to shoot downrange at these targets and guys getting to shoot potato guns and just ball of flames. Like, guys like that, right? Just like, yeah, man, boom. And so, so we went down into, after we had our training class, you know, all the Jesus stuff was over, we went out into the parking lot. And there's probably like 60, 70 guys out there, right? And, and we were going to practice. We wanted to show them the majesty of the potato gun, right? We are going to, pow, shoot it. And so we shoot it like once or twice, and everybody's like, oh. You know, it's like caveman discovering fire, right? It's like, oh. And the discussion began to happen just organically, naturally. Much men, testosterone. Like, <laughs> The question was raised, if somebody were to run and get like a three to five second head start, could another person accurately shoot that said person with the potato gun with a five second head start? And these are, the guys that are discussing this are both 40, 45-ish plus. And I, again, seize the, like if you think you could outrun the potato gun, I think we should try this, right? And so, like, we got video of it. You guys want to see? Well, yeah. yeah. Right outside here. When he hits the basketball goal, One, shoot. Two, there he goes. Four. Oh, four. Oh. <laughs> so, Hollis, like a sniper. Like, no practice shots at all. Hit him right between the shoulder blades, right? I'm talking a 50-mile-per-hour potato. And I was thinking all to myself, like, if that hit him in the head. It's always those thoughts after, right? Like, oh, I didn't think he could hit him, you know? <laughs> and like, I thought maybe he would zigzag. No, he ran a straight line. And I thought Hollis, like, is he really gonna, Hollis is like, oh, this is the moment I've been living for, right? I've dreamed of shooting somebody with a potato gun since I was a boy. And now I've fulfilled my childhood dreams. And so, I, I don't know. I don't know why we are the way we are. I don't know. And I'm just saying, that I don't, I don't know that you grow out of it. You know, you just need to have numbers less than four, all right? And I think most of the time you could avoid those dangers. And so you have to have patience, and then you have to surround yourself with wise counsel to try to avoid some of these pitfalls. And then lastly, I'll close with, with this, that there's in this impatient impulsivity that sometimes we have, there's a battle between waiting and wanting, all right? There's a battle between waiting and wanting. Our wants oftentimes are what we think is right in the moment. But just because we think it's right doesn't mean it's God's best. And so you always have to hold up in your mind what God has said to what you want. And if you want it right now and it's against God's will, you are oftentimes going to mess things up. And there's a crazy story in the Old Testament. And we teach this, the kids a song about Father Abraham and many sons. Anybody know that one? Many sons that Father Abraham, I am one of his. So is he. So are you. Right arm, left arm. It's, right. What are we doing here? All right. Father Abraham. Father Abraham. And, you know, his wife got a little impatient. Do you all remember this story? This is in the Bible, crazy stuff in the Bible. And she came up with an idea. And I want you to know that wives, I, I believe this with all of my heart, you often hold the keys to the direction. Like a man is supposed to lead, but the wife and how, she, like the, the powers of a woman are unparalleled, okay? And she, she comes to Abraham with what I can only imagine is the greatest conundrum that has ever been posed to a man of God, right? And she, she comes to him and is like, you know, this, this plan of God, this promise of God, it's been, it's been taking a while. 
You know, and I think that I found a shortcut to, to, this, to this plan that God has. I have this, this younger, attractive handmaid, and I think if you just, you know, um, and then you could satisfy God's promise through using the handmaid as an alternative conduit. Can you imagine the conundrum that Abraham was in? Like, there's not a right answer to this question. I want you to think about this. Like, he gives in, right? He gives in, but, but you know, like, a couple of years down the road, Sarah has got like, like, I really wanted you to choose no on that, right? And, and yet, like, he, she suggested it, and then he did it, and, like, then it created all these problems. But she's like, why didn't you? She know that you know it got brought up. Like, why? Why did you choose Hagar over? He's like, you, you told me. You told me to do that. Isn't that a crazy story? Like, like, like what, what was Abraham supposed to do right there? I mean, clearly he was supposed to say no, but it was his wife's suggestion. And I thought to myself, is that ever like a template for confusion? I mean, do wives ever ask things, but they don't really mean those things? and they want you to know that they really mean something else other than what they're actually saying and we're trying to like figure out and divine what it is that you really want because you asked me that question but you really didn't mean that question and then I have to somehow take that and then translate it over to this God perspective and like if I could do this God perspective but my wife wants me to do this perspective am I supposed to do what God said or am I supposed to do what wife said and now I'm confused because the two things are pulling me in opposite directions man, if you're ever in between Guys, you ever in between God's will and what you want, you need to choose God's will. And a lot of times you're going to have to wait on God's will. It's not going to happen right away. It's not going to happen in the time frame that you want it most of the time. But is it worth waiting? It's just like in marriage. Carrie and I waited until we got married. Can you imagine if everybody would wait, how much pain could be resolved if you would just wait? When it comes to a season where we've had a downturn, where things aren't going great, whenever we're not getting along, whenever fights are happening. I heard a comedian talking about that, that you ever had those awkward moments in your relationship where you've like went to your neutral corners, but then like you don't time it upright and you got to go through the same hallway and it's as if like you're meeting a stranger, and you're like, okay, yeah, you just, you go through there, and then like, okay, I'm, I'm over here. And it's like, we, we, we do this silent treatment of pouting and stuff like that. I just want you to think about that. A lot of times people want to quit in the waiting time, in the patient time, whenever all the good things, almost all the good things in life are stuff you have to wait on, stuff you have to work on. And if you're willing to be patient during the downtime, what you reap in the end, is so much more beautiful than you could have possibly imagined if you quit during the hard time. When Abraham finally had Isaac and he held his boy in his arm, that was the child of promise. And what if I told you that in this quasi-weird twist of fate, our salvation was wrapped up in Abraham's faithfulness that if he wouldn't have been faithful and keep following through on the promise to have Isaac, that's the descendant through which Jesus came. How important is it for you to wait on God's will, for you to do it God's way? What if I told you that oftentimes other people's fate, your children's fate, their children's children, their fate is wrapped up in your faith and that if you are patient right now, and you stay the course right now, that one day you can hold up that blessing because you stayed the course. It's worth it to wait. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that anyone that walked in today without a happy heart, God, that you would reach down with your grace and that they would be open to it, that you would touch their heart and give them joy. God, that in this moment they would analyze their life and say, what is my perspective? Do I have a perspective that is perpetually drowning in negativity? And if so, is that the will of God? Is that what God wants me to, is that the attitude that God wants me to have? No, it is not. God wants to, you to see yourself 
in the light of his grace, it will both humble the proud and it will lift up those that are struggling in the valley. And it's able to do both at the same time. I pray for all of my people that are sitting in this room today that you would allow God's work in your heart. And the moment that you let grace into your heart, gratitude is going to come forth. You are going to thank God. Thank God. Even for the struggles, thank God. Thank God for the blessings. If he blessed you this week, you should have praise on your lips. And I promise you, as you begin to shift your perspective in light of who God is, your attitude and your relationships, you will find that they will be transformed. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Would you rise and worship with us?